Hey folks, this is CFO Chat, your front row seat with the Chief Finance Officer. I should actually add the Chief Finance and Value Officer. Anytime a corporate action happens, you have all the detail here. Banking season F23 earnings are starting to roll in. As always, the first hit on the block, Stanbic Bank. We are privileged to have Dennis Musao. Dennis, karibu sana. Asante. Congratulations, Thanks. Dennis. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was quite a um, good performance by Stanbic and as we give you your flowers, allow me to take the contrarian view. Okay. When I was coming through your earnings, by Q3, you had already breached the F22 net earnings by about 2.1%. So actually, I expected larger growth. Yeah. As I say congrats, I expected yeah. larger growth. Yeah. And it looks to me when I do my math, like in the fourth quarter, you had a bit of slowdown or tapering off of the momentum. Yeah. Is that a fair assessment? Um, it's not, it's not entirely, uh, wrong, but there's some context <laughs> to it. Yeah. So, uh, in, in Q1 2023, we posted 84% growth. Uh, through H1, we posted 47% growth. Um, and then through Q3, we posted 33% growth, and then full year 34% growth. So you can see a bit of stability coming to the end of the year. So what happened in the first, uh, in the first quarter and the first half of the year? Um, we had a massive transaction um, in, the, in the first quarter of the year where we facilitated the largest um, share transfer in the history of the Nairobi Securities Exchange. Yes. Um, um, and as a result, uh, made, made some earnings in fees, uh, facilitated the transaction flows, and therefore some uh, currency, uh, currency exchange fees. That is what created that, that uh, bump in our earnings. But when I look at the fundamentals of growth, when I look at the balance sheet growth, very smooth uh, um, throughout the year. Of course, as the year has progressed, um, we have continued to Re revisit our pricing. Uh, you do remember we got our uh, risk-based pricing approval towards the tail end of 2022. So Correct. we have been on that Correct. journey of implementing that. But hey, cost of funding also came along the way. So <laughs> it's been this uh, balancing effect and that is, that is what you see throughout the year. I see. Yeah. And we'll be getting back into the discussion around the cost of funding. And maybe just for the sake of our viewers, in case you lost there, it is about how you mobilize deposits and the cost you have in terms of interest payments. Yeah. Speaking about the stellar growth we have seen, when you look at the numbers and you unbundle them, uh, could you give us some context around what you'd say is attributable to, to the loan repricing? Mm -hmm. And what is attributable to volume growth when it comes to churning out? Because your loan book is up by some good number. Yeah. So our net interest income uh, in the year increased by 35%. When I break up uh, interest income vis-a-vis -vis interest expense, we're talking about 45% in the, in the gross interest income and 72% in interest expense. And that's massive, and I'm yeah. glad we'll talk about cost of funding at some point. But when I look at just the pricing, um, the income uh, generation, two-thirds of that is volume. Now, you may not see exactly the same growth on the uh, gross balance sheet because what we saw more was our customers transitioning toward the shorter end of the of, of uh, financial instruments, <coughs> trade facilities, short-term funding, overdraft, etc., etc., which is uh, normal in yeah. a rate environment like what we see. So two thirds is a um, is a volume uh, play. The other third is when where pricing has come through in terms of implementation risk-based pricing rate changes in terms of the base rate. Our base rate has gone up about 135 basis points, um, uh, which is what we are using today. I see. Yeah. So it's volume heavy. It's volume heavy, yeah. I see. Yeah. When we sat down with you uh, about six months ago, we were touching base on the half year numbers. And um, at the time, I'm just revisiting the notes I took at the time, 70% of your retail clients were on risk-based pricing. About 40% of your commercial segment was on risk-based pricing. Mm. Is it safe to assume at this point everyone is on risk-based? Not 100%. Um, implementation of this uh, requires engagement with customers, yeah. requires um, 
requires a notification to customers who are now the way there. The ratios are definitely higher than that. Um, but what we've seen uh, is some of our customers, especially in the corporate and the commercial sectors, we've seen them saying, as opposed to this kind of static uh, pricing model, okay. uh, move us to, the, to, to a market market facing um, uh, type of model. So link us to SOFA, link us to the um, uh, to, to, to T-Bill, which kind of helps them uh, be able to, trans in the transparency of uh, the, the pricing they, 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 they want to see. So we are not 100% on, uh, on risk-based pricing. We are on our way there, but there's uh, more and more of our customers actually asking to be on market observable rate, which is allowed by, by the approval that we got from the regulator. A quick follow-up there is how do the ratios look like now? Um, I would say 50% of the book is on the market market okay. linked uh, uh, linked book, and that is uh, looking at uh, the entire the entire portfolio. Um, about 30 percent, uh, 30 to 35% is on risk-based pricing. The rest is uh, internal pricing, the one that we're transitioning from, and a bit of it is actually fixed. So there are some certain customers who say, just give me a fixed price. And I actually think that's about 8 to 9% uh, yeah. of, our, yeah. of our book that is around that. Dennis, one of the sweet spots in these numbers <clears throat> is uh, your asset quality. Yeah. Your non-performing loan book, especially from the ratio side, mm -hmm. down to the single digits. Yeah. And especially in this environment, you know, I, I, I looked at it and I had to do my math about three times <laughs> yes. to, just to yes. be sure that I'm getting it correctly. Yes. yes, yes. It looks to me like you might have had some major write-off. Mm -hmm. uh, could you give us some context? Yeah. So, look, I actually thought the sweeter spot uh, would be the dividend yield, but I'm sure we'll get there. <laughs> um, <laughs> Look, the reality is the credit risk environment uh, is tough. Yeah. I mean, um, whether you talk about corporate customers, whether you talk about commercial customers, whether you talk about individuals, and I actually think, um, you know, numbers are an outcome. Um, when the writers of history start writing on the environment in 2020 to 2023, which is what the balance sheet reflects, these yeah. are assets we've booked in that period, they will, they will have a lot to think about uh, because you can talk about the global macros. You can talk about the geopolitical tensions that we continue to see every day. You can talk about inflationary pressures that we haven't seen um, in, the, in the last while. You can talk about currency and where it has found itself. Absolutely. You can talk about interest rates. The last time we saw these kind of interest rates, um, especially the hikes, was more than 10 years ago. So there is a lot that is contributing to the environment. And therefore, the environment is really an <coughs> outcome. Now, in the, in the bank, we take a very, a very structured and governed view yeah. on how we treat facilities. Um, and if I just do a rundown, last year we closed, 2022, we closed our gross NPLs at $28 billion. Um, there have been new entrants to that, uh, to that, uh, 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 to that fold, yeah. but we've also taken some write-offs, some fully, uh, especially in the retail sector where it is fully unsecured, some partial in the commercial and corporate sector where we've got some uh, re recoverable amounts. And that is just to ensure that our balance sheet is lean and clean and, mm -hmm. and we, we have a right representation of, uh, uh, of what, what we're able to, to, to mine. Yeah. So that's, that, that is what moves you from the 28 to, to, to kind of the 26. I see. Yeah. So what, 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 uh, what's the size of the write-off? Around in the region of 10 billion. I see. In the region of 10 billion. So you're talking about additional NPLs of about 6, six billion. You're talking about about 2.4 billion in currency yeah. because 54% of our NPL book is actually FCY. So there's just inflation okay. Uh, okay. of the balance uh, uh, doing nothing. But then you, you've got uh, these this write-offs that we've taken a view of uh, on some, I mean, not 
too many customers, um, a handful. Uh, there's um, a fair number that is in the CADS area, the UPR, CTC, ETC. Okay. Yeah. FCY is foreign currency, LCY is local currency. Forgive Dennis. <laughs> Sorry uh, about that. Are you getting to a point where you would say, I'm just getting from the tone of your, both at the presentation and now, mm -hmm. would you say you're increasingly cherry picking across sectors uh, just to guard yourself against the credit risk in this market? Um, in any business, you've got to be selective. Yeah. I'm yet to. Uh, find uh, an individual or a business that is successful doing everything. <laughs> um, so um, our strategy is aligned to the winners uh, of the market. So you will see us do business in the agricultural sector and wonder why are you doing that because agriculture is 23, 24% of this uh, GDP. Yeah. It's growing at about 6.7% as of the last print. So that's, that's positive. You will see us um, participate in manufacturing and, and industry. Again, that is growing uh, double digit. You will see us in the services sector. Um, um, again, that is growing by, by close to 20% 20, uh, 20 as of the last print that I saw. So, we are, our, our strategy continues to align to the winners of, uh, of, of, of the market. Those winners are in part dictated by capital markets, but also government policy. Yeah. Government uh, policy goes this way, you see winners aligning there. And yes, the answer is we cannot bank everyone. Uh -huh. I think um, the, the, you know, um, uh, Steve Jobs is, is, uh, is uh, famous for um, saying that he's a pr is uh, as proud of the things that they didn't do as those things that um, they actually they actually did. So we are as proud of the sectors that we have chosen not to operate in as we are in the sectors that um, that we choose to, to to operate in. That lens continues to change. However, mm. it is not stuck in 2010, 2020. You know, we we keep on it reviewing evolves, that yeah. to say, okay. Uh, what is our thoughts? What are our thoughts around the education sector? Yeah. What is our thoughts around um, circles, for example? Mm. Are they locally relevant? Are they are they instrumental into the future of Kenya? And how do we play in that area? Yeah. So, in which in which spaces are you deepening exposure? In which ones are you cutting back? I've mentioned some of them. I've mentioned <laughs> some of them. We're not necessarily holding back because, again, strategy. You know, you don't it's bank dynamic. the oil yeah. majors. And then tomorrow morning you say, I've, I've yeah, changed. Yeah. And, the, and the growth vectors don't change a lot. So you will see us play a lot in the oil and gas sector. You will see us play in the power infrastructure sector. You will see us play a lot in the manufacturing sector. Agriculture will continue being there. FIs and financial institutions and non-bank financial institutions will continue being there. So those, those winners, and then you will see some exigencies into education into um, a bit of the uh, savings savings environment Th those those are the areas that we want to play in. and that is at the corporate yeah. and commercial area um, coming further down and one of the beauties of our new strategy is that uh, when we did some background work we realized that organizations only grow from their points of strength yeah. so we've built a very a relatively strong uh, a private bank, uh, banking executives, banking uh, private clients, banking the wealthy, showing them opportunities locally and, and offshore. We want to grow from that point into how do we bank the wealthy, the executives, the privates of the future. Yeah. So you will see um, us e e exerting ourselves in those, in, those, uh, in those spaces going forward. There was mention at the briefing that uh, your good NPL ratio, non-performing loan ratio notwithstanding, yeah. you still see further room to kind of bring it lower than it is right now. Mm -hmm. so, so my question here is, one, um, what would be a sweet spot? And secondly, how, how is the flow looking like when it comes to how you have the buckets of, of the loans from stage two especially mm -hmm. to those which are now falling into that category, which would say now here, we're dealing with a serious situation. The way I like to look at uh, NPL, NPL is almost an outcome. 
Um, if you bank a customer whose intention is not to repay you, it will, might take a few days, but it will come back as an NPL. So our, our strategy to getting to single digit NPL ratio, which is where we want to remain below 10%, um, is ensuring that we are banking our client selection, our credit vetting and evaluation processes are, are solid. And that is institutionalized in the, in the corporate and commercial and business customers. In the retail sector, we are deploying more of technology. So we're doing more of, of credit scoring, um, availing limits to customers based on, on the on evidence data, we've worked on the on the predictive uh, predictive models to ensure that we can tell, um, you know, uh, Julian's from Dennis in terms of uh, uh, risk profile, etc., etc. So, origination evaluation for us is critical. Yeah. And then there's a phase two, which is around intimately staying close to the customer to understand their business and their cycles. The reality is. Um, you know, when you lend to someone for 20 years, you lend based on what you know today. The reality is a lot happens in 20 years. Yeah. So you've got to stay very close. Now, I am always proud when I see Stanbic Bank winning, and we've won the Best Investment Bank uh, Award for the last 11 years running. It tells you something. It tells you because investment banking is around, beyond the lending, it's around advisory. Is around solving complex, important problems, structuring for clients uh, to ensure we solve those problems. It also tells you subliminally that you understand the client. Our strength is in staying close to the client to understand, okay, you are in the tea export business. You are exporting to Pakistan or to Egypt. Um, dollars have become an issue. What do we do together? to help you solve that problem. Because nothing has fundamentally changed in your business model. Or maybe something needs to change in your business model. So it is in that staying close um, with our customers where we see winning. And then there's rehabilitation. So when things go wrong, what do we do? So we, we, we and, and I've said this to you before, um, you know, the way we think about uh, our non-performing customers is they are customers who get there by accident. Yeah. Never intended to default, something has just happened, the business is decimated, and you're both looking at each other, what do we do? And we want to have that conversation. They are customers that go through some winter cycles. So it's uh, spring, it's shiny, um, and then winter comes. Yeah. You know, you've got to ride that cycle uh, with a customer. For those we think about structuring, restructuring, rethinking the cash flow models, etc. And then there are people who borrow with the intention from day zero of never repaying. And they are there. Now, for those, you have to have uh, different, um, different uh, medication. That is why we've continued to bolster our collection capabilities, the collection systems um, that we use, the collection manpower that we use to ensure we manage that. Now, if I look at the staging of the book, um, last year when I spoke to you, 2020, the NPL ratio was 11%. Um, there was an about 9% in stage two. Um, actually around 8%. There was about 8% in stage two. That gives you 19%. And then there was 81% in stage one. Yeah. Right? In 2023, uh, it's 9% in stage three. And then there's 80% in stage one. Okay. So you see um, there's, there's uh, an 11% in that in stage the, two. Yes. Indicative of the credit environment. And that's, those are the customers that we are actively reviewing, engaging, understanding um, what's going on in their business and how we work together. Now, that then transmits to the impairment numbers that you've seen. So you've seen our impairment has ticked up 27%, um, which is almost to say, okay, hang on, <laughs> your quality is better, but what's going on? But remember, yes. by FRS rules, you have IFRS. Now, I, I am... I'm, I'm cognizant to define this. <laughs> By accounting rules, we're required to take a little bit more provisions yes. on, that, uh, on those stage two names. So, so that's the profile of the book as we see it.
Still on your long book, um, yeah. last year had elevated foreign exchange pressures. Yeah. And my question to you here is, what proportion of your loan book was converted from hard currency, USD, etc., mm. to the Kenya shilling, just to try, as clients wanted to mitigate their exposure to FX risk? I, I, I do not have the, the actual number, but I will tell you the profile change. So last year when I spoke to you, 20, December 2022, 48% of our loan book was local currency. 52% was foreign currency. Today, uh, or 31st December 2023, 63% are local currency, 37%. So there's a 15% shift for three reasons. One, what you speak to, some customers, because of rising uh, base rates for the foreign currency loans, they see no reason and they, they, they see no comparative advantage in, um, in maintaining that uh, foreign currency borrowing. And therefore, they've uh, come and asked us to, um, to, to, to convert that. Not in the droves, but there is some, some of them. The second is the, is the, um, the, the, the change in dynamics of the oil and, and gas sector. So um, our oil marketers uh, demanded more of um, FCY at the time, of foreign currency at the time. That has shifted to demanding facilities in, uh, in local currency as they, um, as, they, uh, as they fund the escrow account in, in, in dealing with the, with, the, with the shipments. And then the third is we've actually seen more appetite as we transition now to the new strategy of banking more of the local corporates, in banking more of the local SMEs, in being trans uh, transaction-led. So that we have seen almost an accretion to the, to the local currency uh, loan book, as it were. And uh, to something which you alluded to before you came to this, so your provisions, have increased significantly. Yeah. Would you say your cost of risk is playing where you feel it should, especially in the present environment? Yes. So we've set a risk appetite uh, of our, of, of the way we measure it is your credit loss ratio. We have operated within that uh, credit loss ratio for the last um, three, four years. Um, different pockets of businesses. So some businesses will will pierce it in their individual subunit, but at a legal entity level, we've, we've operated there. I think we would, we would uh, not be, so the balance here is what is enough risk? Because if we um, you know, tighten and, and, and get the credit loss ratio to zero, then you can see what happens to the book. Um, um, if we open the taps, um, then you can you can you lose all the all that you've made in in uh, in, in income. The the 2.35 percent that we've reported compared to 2.21 percent that we reported at half year uh, at um, uh, full year last year 2.18 that we reported as as uh, half year. That geography of around the 2.2 2.3 is a good geography and is within within our risk appetite. I guess for us the, the the real challenge is how do we how do we keep it there? How do we keep it uh, within appetite? Uh, you know, talk, thinking about the risk environment that we've uh, we've we've talked about, and that is where closeness to our customers, ensuring our customers are not just getting getting a mortgage, but we are thinking through their home ownership journey, ensuring our customers are not just in getting their car and not thinking about how that impacts their credit card, their um, you know, unsecured prof um, uh, personal loan. Thinking about all that geography for us is, is where we've got to work more with our customers. Uh, because there are customers who end up defaulting because they went for each of the facilities transactionally. They never quite thought about the entire, uh, the entire uh, risk that they are taking. And it's our job to ensure that happens. In an environment where um, 
top tier companies in this market have been slashing dividends. It was quite a brief to see the numbers you put out and the recommended dividend. Just walk us through how you arrived at that um, and what, what you anticipate going forward. We famously paid a dividend during COVID. <laughs> I remember uh, the so COVID <laughs> period. Um, Do you regret that, by the way? No. No. You see, um, the way we think about, um, we've got a whole spectrum of stakeholders. We've got to take care of our customers, and we do take care of them in the solutioning that we provide. We've got to take care of our staff, and we do, back in the office, think about how we take care of our staff um, uh, properly. We've got to take care of the government and the regulators and the environment in which we operate, and we discuss how we deal with that. And then shareholders yeah. are an important player. They provide um, capital. They've provided us with $68 billion worth of capital for us to invest in. Now, when we step back and say, but what are you doing for, uh, for these folks? We think about it in the form of um, share price. And yeah. you've seen in our, project, in our presentation that that has gone up, and therefore they've made some capital gains. But it's actually cash dividend. To the, and to the extent that we can meet three criteria, we'll pay a dividend. The first is, when you look forward, do we have sufficient capital to continue funding growth? Yeah. We go through that math, we stress it, and we, we, we get comfortable with it. Uh, number two, are we meeting the regulatory and internal risk appetite thresholds that we've set? Again, we go through that process thoroughly and go all the way, um, a full year view, sometimes even a two year view uh, to, to, to get to the conclusion. And then number three, are we keeping sufficient buffers yeah. to absorb any, any, any shocks? You would know that uh, banks do an, uh, go through an annual um, internal capital assessment process, which looks three years out. And when we go through that and we look at the basis points that, of capital that will be called upon uh, based on the risks that we see in the environment, anything else belongs to the shareholders. Guess what? Because of that dividend payout efficiency, you can see our, our um, return on uh, equity, um, you know, accreting every year from 10.4 in, 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 in 20 uh, to 13.3 in 21 to 15.3 in 22 to 18.6 uh, in, 20, in 23. And you're I'm targeting more, the 20s. I think we need to get there. I think, we, and look, <laughs> look, um, if uh, the owners of this 68 billion, um, uh, asked us why shouldn't we invest in the infrastructure bond which is paying at at 18 very 19 <laughs> actually <laughs> <laughs> you know I've, we've got to demonstrate that beyond the fact that there is more value created to others i mean there's homes that are being owned there's cars being yeah. owned there's transactions and trade being facilitated beyond that activity there's a uh, um you know a return on their investment wow and that's, uh, that dividend actually gives a very good yield uh, yeah. to, to your shareholders. Yeah. So, you know, and that, so your results gave me a very mixed picture. Um, so on one hand, uh, the income statement, the PNL is looking very strong. When you look at your provisions, they are being ramped up significantly. I thought everyone is talking about risks in the horizon. I thought I would have seen a more conservative bump up on the dividend, but here we are. So it looks like when you look forward, you're not too worried. No, because uh, I don't even I, I don't even think we are allowed to be worried. Because banks and financial services sector uh, broadly is a very important player in the economy. Um, there is only about forty five fifty thousand. Kenyans who have the privilege of working in banks today. I, I don't have the exact numbers, but I, um, the last stats I read were around that area. Over 15 million people. So you cannot be that privileged and yeah. be, lead the chorus of worrying. I think the opportunity and the privilege we have is to help the market navigate the challenges that we see. Because there is no shortage of people. 
and commentators <laughs> to talk about the problem and yes. define it, complete with the data points. But what we are called upon to do, which is what Standard Bank, um, uh, working together with Citibank, is called upon to do is help us manage the, uh, the liability, um, um, you know, uh, the liabilities we have at a government level. That is where we see our, our job. So we take uh, an optimistic, a collaborative view to solving the problem as opposed to being experts and defining at, um, you know, how wrong things could, could go. Because if we do that, um, you know, what happens to the people in Wajia and yeah. uh, Garissa and Kitui who don't have the privilege to sit at the front uh, row seat that we have today. That was a very good, good way to slide in the lead arranging role for the $1.5 billion <laughs> euro bond. <laughs> Dennis, let's close by speaking a little bit about the macro environment. Yeah. Uh, one of your biggest headaches in these numbers is cost of funding. And when I look forward, we, you know, the government has taken financing by the bucket loads, the euro bond, the infrastructure bond, massively oversubscribed. Mm. We thought we would have seen a bit of moderation of appetite in the short end on the T-bill market. We didn't see it. Mm. So yields could be staying higher for longer. Mm. And that worries me as far as the cost of funding is concerned. Because if you look at the interest expense, for example, in your numbers, it's up significantly. Mm. What's your strategy going forward? I think the reality is markets are not emotional. Markets are markets. Markets, they can be sentimental. They can kind of think about the future uh, project, but markets take a view based on the data and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and statistics that are available. Uh, where we find our rates today in terms of yields, whether it is the T-bills, uh, uh, the return that is being asked on the on the bonds is a reality of market sentiment, um, and markets don't don't quite have a cap to say, oh, you know, we can never go to twenty. If markets need to get to thirty, they will get, they there. Will get there, and they've gotten there elsewhere. I I, I think the view we have uh, internally is to is to then be responsive to what we see, to the best of our knowledge. Um, again. Uh, in response to, uh, to that market. So how do we think about it? We think about it in three ways. Number one, the customer is going to be at the center of this. So our cost of funds, which is, um, which is uh, you know, the rate at which we collect deposits, deposits yes. has gone up in local currency about 230 basis points on a, on a, on a you know, uh, averaged basis. Our um, foreign currency has gone up by about 140, 130 uh, basis points. So you blend that, you're in the region of 100, uh, of uh, 200, you know, 180, 200. We've not necessarily matched that with the pricing because you've got a balance. Yeah. How much can you transmit uh, to the customers without creating uh, impairments because I mean it's all glory to to add uh, to your revenue but then it could all come leaking now in in any industry where you cannot transmit the full costs of your you know traditional cost of sales in manufacturing to customers you also have to think about your cost of operations so and that is the other the other vector so we think about the customer and how we transmit that to the to the customer and we haven't fully transmitted that to the customer we have to balance that the other piece then to manage our earnings we have to think about our internal cost of operations and this is the point at which then you almost go back and say thank god we invested in some of the things we did in 2020 2021 i mean if we were doing the level of lending we are doing today uh, through intuitive and someone going and ticking um, through pay, uh, with a pen and paper, how would be uh, arduous and would be very expensive. Yeah. Today, more than ninety percent of our lending, you know, kind of goes through, uh, especially the retail, goes through um, uh, systems. So you you kind of uh, reap the benefits of that. We've automated how we do reconciliations, etc., etc. So you've got to think about your cost of operations. So that kind of gives you the income statement. The third vector 
is your balance sheet. Yeah. How do you position your balance sheet for, um, for where the rates are and where they are projected to be? Now, a lot is written about this, but the way we think about it simplistically is, you know, can, can the balance sheet respond to, um, to the term uh, that we see uh, rates staying, which is why most of our book, for example, is priced uh, flexibly, and then you will see the profile kind of migrating um, closer to shorter term financing. Again, responsive to customers. Customers are also saying, I would rather operate with a trade facility, an OD, as opposed to timing me when, uh, when rates are going up. So that's, that's how we're balancing that dynamic. Okay. Yeah. And speaking about that third vector of the balance sheet, um, and, and going back to what you've just alluded to in terms of um, how you have seen the cost of funding evolve, local currency mm. versus foreign currency. Mm. Is it an in, isn't it an interesting time to be rejigging your balance sheet to be more local currency? The latest number we have is about 56%. Mm. Uh, I've got no question on directionally the approach you're taking. Yeah. It's spot on. Yeah. My question is the timing mm -hmm. given that variation. So the statistics have shown you for, LC, for local currency and uh, uh, foreign currency um, uh, cost of funding is only that they are, they are, they are diluted mm -hmm. by the fact that part of the financing is, is, a, is current accounts, which are non-earning. But if you actually look at the basis of, fin uh, basis of uh, pricing, if you look at local currency, the benchmark rate went up 375 basis points. Uh, T-bills, which is, is an indicator, went up by uh, around the same region. The uh, foreign currency uh, funding, the basis rate so far, uh, went up around, around the same uh, basis point. So there is a, it is just a matter of time, mm -hmm. depending on the profile between your, your current accounts and uh, and your other sources of funding, fixed deposit savings, which are um, interest earning, it's a matter of time before you see the, the individual unblended cost of funding between the currencies uh, 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 kind of match. Given that data point, then it is not time to slow down on being transaction-led. Yeah. Uh, now, if you're going to bank SMEs um, and you're going to, to fulfill their trade facility needs, and you're going to f um, facilitate them to, um, uh, to draw on overdraft ETC, ETC. And you're going to facilitate locally relevant sectors like education, like um, uh, the savings culture, like um, home loans. Then you need to be tr uh, transmitting the other side. So um, for me, uh, the timing is right. The timing is influenced by the customers, but when I look at the data and where the cost of funding is, um, it's, it's uh, validated by the fact that the base uh, rates uh, will, will um, you know, have almost gone up the same way. Now, if the Fed tasts, starts turning the rates, um, no. uh, I think they're meeting in March, if they start turning the rates, uh, it is possible within a relatively uh, uh, decent period of time, we might start to see that as well, because of course, the new cost flows uh, coming to emerging markets, and therefore, you know, uh, yield starts to respond. So, uh, you you cannot stop, um, you know, you, you can't uh, stop kind of driving along the longer journey because of these dynamics. They need to be managed, but I think the strategic uh, move towards localizing our balance sheet, being locally relevant, being a truly Kenyan and South Sudan, uh, South Sudan bank and driving that through our purpose is going to remain. Two last questions. The first one is, um, when do you see the Central Bank of Kenya, it is widely expected, will begin dialing down and cutting back the rates. Mm. When do you see that unwinding happening or starting? And does the potential erosion of the strong growth you've seen in the interest income then concern you about your outlook? Um, the answer to the first one is I don't know. <laughs> I did say earlier that uh, markets can be sentimental, but they're not emotional. I think the monetary policy stance that we're seeing from the central bank is to be responsive to the sentiment of the market. So if and when 
global market. Start uh, turning the market sentiment around Kenya starts uh, uh, turning either way. We will see that response. I don't know when that's going to come. Um, do I worry about you know uh, 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 reduction in uh, benchmark rates? No, because of two reasons. One, I've got an opportunity to rethink my pricing on both the asset side and the liability side. That's the one thing. And then number two, uh, we're watching the balance sheet profile. As long as uh, the instruments that we have on the balance sheet are responsive to those market dynamics, we should be able to respond um, comfortably. My final question, Dennis, you know, uh, someone watched our interview from last year this time. Mm -hmm. And one of the questions I asked you was, uh, I thought this is the time you will have joined the 10 billion club in net earnings. Yes. And when your numbers came out yesterday, that person called me and she told me, you must now ask him, mm -hmm. how does he feel about it? It feels great. It feels great to deliver more than 10 billion in, in profitability. But I think for me, it's not about the, the number is an outcome. For me, what actually feels greater is when I think about um, those colleagues at Stanbic Bank that have gone out and facilitate, uh, facilitated home ownership. For me, that's, that's, that's prouder. Those colleagues at the bank who have gone, gone out and shaped and uh, structured investment banking transactions to drive infrastructure growth in infrastructure development in this country I think that for me is uh, is, is is very exciting I I am excited about those colleagues in the bank who have gone out and facilitated the biggest share transfer in the history of the NAC uh, in 2023 that for me is actually where the greatness is now I am even more excited around the work we do with our foundation Today, um, we facilitated through a partner, uh, through partnerships we have with, with, um, with uh, some some multinational um, uh, 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 partners. Uh, we facilitated catalytic and grants funding to one thousand five hundred and sixty-three. If we keep the pace of profitability and keep this number uh, growing, I think that for us is a great, uh, is, is great. We've facilitated 4,703 4, Kenyans to be screened uh, for cancer for free. Yeah. We've facilitated um, kids to go to, uh, to school. I think that for me is what makes me pr uh, proud. And hey, as that happens, if I get to 10 billion, <laughs> who is complaining? <laughs> Good point to leave it at, Dennis Musau. Always you. a pleasure speaking to you, man. Thank you. Thank you. That takes yeah. us to the close of our conversation on CFO Chat, unpacking the numbers of Stanbic Holdings PSC, PLC, I should say, the first bank to release their full year F23 numbers. We wait. Next week we'll be quite busy. Keep it here to get the latest. Stay tuned.